A series of articles in 1835 give... Well, I guess it's 1835, so not a new definition, but we'll go with it. A series of articles in 1835 give an old definition to fake news. And then we take a look at the horrific tragedy of the Meduse. And this one, you guys get to play along today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. No snow today, so that's awesome. So I'm good. I'm good. No snow. Now, I wanted to let you guys know something. Quick quick little update. So it is the winter break. Everyone's kind of, for the most part, going back to... Or it's coming up to winter break. Finals for some of you. And then winter break. But anyways, people are going to be traveling to their homes, to the places that they came from, or maybe you're just where you're at right now. But you may have some free time, and in this moment, I'm going to ask a favor of you guys. I'm getting reviews, and that's awesome. Definitely love getting reviews. That helps the channel get found on platforms like iTunes. But I want to go a little old school with this. And we did this a while back, but I want to start it back up again. I want flyers. So I have a link in the description below either on YouTube or your podcast provider, you'll see a little link down there, for a flyer. I would like you guys to print that out and put that up around town. I think that flyers are not used for podcasts. I think it's something that will definitely stand out. We're going to have two versions of the flyer, one with the Dead Rabbit logo by Ash Black, which is the red and black logo. And you can just print it out in black and white, dude. You don't got to do anything fancy. And then the second one is the Dead Rabbit As Above logo by Grant Scott. And both of them are just going to be pretty bare bones. But that would be awesome. I know a lot of you guys have gotten back to me saying you're recommending me to your friends and family. And that means a lot. It definitely helps the show grow. But let's put up, let's go old school. Let's do like, um, what are those things called? Um, basically a um, street team, street team. Let's do it. Let's, let's get some, I put flyers up around my town. And I, it, it works. I went and flyered when I was vacationing in California. I put a bunch of flyers up in the Bay Area and have seen a permanent increase in my listenership from California. It definitely works because people love to find something. People base their stuff on recommendations from friends and family. But we have a, we have, when you discover something yourself, like all of you have just kind of stumbled across this show and have fallen in love with it or maybe just fallen in like with it. But you just kind of stumble into the show and you click a link or you see a little podcast download, you listen to it, and you just like, this. I'm part of this because I discovered it. It's a human thing and it beats any sort of advertising that you can do. We haven't advertised the show outside of putting up flyers and someone walks by and looks at it and goes, that's weird. What's this? And they're intrigued. So I would really, really appreciate it if you guys did that over the winter break and going forward. But yeah, just throw a couple flyers up. And it's actually kind of cool. I used to run a bunch of street teams back in the day. You kind of feel a bit like a vandal, but you're getting the word out. So And, and don't vandalize. <laughs> don't glue them to police cars or anything like that. I'm not going to say don't spray paint my logo anywhere, but that's up to you. The first story we're going to talk about today is something I touched on yesterday with the Thomas Dick story. The Thomas Dick and Mungo Dick story. And he plays a small part in the story. The story is really interesting because it's it has a lot of parallels to today. And it is considered, the very f- in human history, the very first mass media event. So we're going back in time to the year 1835. We're in New York City. So they didn't have skyscrapers, they just had scrapers. They didn't go all the way up to the sky. But it was a bustling city. You had all these newspapers that were constantly competing with each other. And one of those newspapers was The Sun. And they had, a, a like I said, a ton of competition. They were a big newspaper, and they actually had two things going for them that gave them an edge over their rivals. One, they had a steam-powered printing press. So they're like, oh, this thing can print... Three papers an hour. Just steam. It actually allowed them to produce massive amounts of paper, but I just imagine it being really slow. There's like a guy playing a, uh, what's those big pianos? Like an organ. There's like a guy playing an organ to make it work. Steam shooting out everywhere. Calliope. Calliope was actually what I was looking for. 
So the other element they had, and it's funny because nowadays when we think of old-timey newspapers, we immediately think of this, but the Sun was, if not the first, one of the first, and I actually think they were the first, newsboys, newsies. The Sun said, hey, let's get a bunch of street urchins to go out there and yell, extra, extra, read all about it. It was, the f- it was this huge breakthrough in marketing the media. So you had the ability to produce a lot of newspapers within a day, and you had these kids screeching at you all day long about what the newspaper was, so you couldn't really ignore the news. And there was no radio, there was no television. This is what you had. This is where you got your information. One of, the ma- uh, one of their other major rivals had a fire at their printing press, so they were out of operation. The Sun's like, okay, this is good. This is working out really good for us. People were buying their newspaper to read about the fire at the other newspaper company. But they thought, you know what? We need something big. We need a kill shot of a whamdinger of an article. Is it a, is it a, it doesn't matter. Is it a rumdinger? Anyways, it, we need this amazing article to finally knock all of our competition off. So somebody, and we don't know who, no one has ever come forward to claim credit for creating this story. But somebody said, let's write a six-day series about alien. Aliens, I mean, people had thought about alien life, because Thomas, Thomas Dick was talking about it. And people were fascinated by the idea of life on other planets. People were, there were still unexplored parts of the planet. People were fascinated with life everywhere. But they said, let's, and, and various cultures and stuff like that. And they said, let's do a six-day series on aliens on the moon. And you can just imagine the editorial board is like, that, that just might work. One problem, we're a newspaper, we're not a fictional. But they're like, no, we can write this in a way that people will think it is real. So the first, they had a little advertisement for it one day. Just a little paragraph saying, you know, this is what our series is going to be. There was, an, there was a scientist named Sir John Herschel. So he was a knight. He was very, very highly regarded. And they thought, let's just, let's just use this real dude's name to set up this fake story. Without his permission or anything. He wouldn't have given it, of course, because of what follows. But imagine, it would be the equivalent today as if someone said, let's say that... We found these works of Carl Sagan, and he has all this stuff about aliens. Like, he, he wrote these papers, and then they're complete lies, but you're attaching it to one of the preeminent scientists of the time. So they have this little paragraph, and they're like, Sir John Herschel built this brand new telescope, and it saw stuff on the moon. Stay tuned to our six-part series. And people are like, well, that, that's kind of, that's intriguing. Just a little paragraph, though. Just a little teaser, right? And so it, the first article is basically that came out was like set up the storyline. So they're like, there's this telescope. It's the biggest telescope in the world at the time. It was like 24 feet. The lens was like 24 feet in diameter. And it had this special lighting mechanism inside of it so it could light up what it was seeing. It would make what it was seeing bright and easily discernible. And trust me, this this made up telescope sees some really, really like detailed things on the moon. So it has to be super powerful. And they're like, all of this stuff is going to be presented in this very prestigious scientific magazine. I think it was, I think it was the Journal of Edinburgh or something. The scientific magazine. But we, the Sun, have a sneak peek because one of his assistants told us what he saw. So before you read it in this actually real, super important scientific journal, we're going to tell you what it is. So it's lending credibility to all this. The first article is like, he used the the telescope, and he saw these plants. He saw, like, first he was just looking at the detailed rocks, but then he started noticing these red, crimson, I guess that's the same thing, but these crystals sticking off the rock. Then he started seeing these flowers and these plants, these weird geometrically shaped plants on the moon. And that was pretty much the first article, and people were like, oh my god, oh, there's life on the moon. This, this scientist who's never lied to us before saw all this crazy stuff so the next day they're like oh then 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 he looked at the telescope again and there was like bugs and animals walking around uh, like bison like creatures walking around on the surface of the moon you can't see it with your telescope but with his special telescope you can see it and now people are really starting to get hooked on this story they're like there's uh, there's creatures it's not just plants there's actual creatures on the moon 
The whole thing was fake, obviously, but people started to say, oh, yeah, no, I, I was there when they packed up the telescope and shipped it off to, I think it was in Scotland was where he was using it. I, I, I know that this is true. So the, the, the myth was growing. People who had nothing to do with the lie started to basically suffer some sort of mass delusion and saying, oh, no, 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 it's totally true. I was there when this happened. I was there when this happened. And other newspapers at this point were like, this is probably fake, but we better cover it because it might not be fake. So the third day, they're like, dude, guess what else he saw with that massive telescope that doesn't exist? I mean, does exist. Beavers. But these beavers walk on two legs, live in huts, start fires, not like just wildfires, but like they can create fire. And they carry their young like we do. They actually said that the beavers' houses were better constructed than the savages on our planet. So, I mean, a little bit of... You you can't have a newspaper article in 1835 without a little bit of racism. So these beavers, and people are like, oh my god, there's like cave beavers on the planet Moon. No, I mean, not on the planet Moon. There's cave beavers on the Moon. This, I cannot wait for tomorrow. If this is only part three in six parts... Something has to beat the beaver. Because these guys rock. And at this point, New York is electrified. And the story starts to spread out of New York. Because again, they didn't have the mass communication we have now. But newspapers in Boston started to pick it up. It started to move further and further west. And over time, it would start to cross the ocean and be big stories over there as well. But now we're at the fourth day. And New York's on the edge of its seat. You got little boys on the street going, Re- extra, extra, read all about it. Beavers carry babies like humans. And stuff like that. So, day four. We're at day four. We've discovered, we've discovered a new species on the moon. Two arms, two legs. Bodies of men, really. But, they have bat wings. Their arms flip up. And they have like wings from their wrists down to their thighs. And they can glide across the moon. And with my super special telescope, I actually saw their lips moving as they talked. So they're smart like we are. That's where the telescope... I don't care how powerful your telescope is. You're not going to be able to see people's lips moving. But he's like, they're obviously conversing. And, and they do dirty things. They have sex in public. So, I mean, of course, that blows people's minds they're like oh my god they're just like these humanoid they're tall they fly around and they do dirty things that we're not allowed to do everyone's like (gasps) girls are clutching their pearls and women are fainting and men are taking the newspaper to the bathroom they also had a lot of drawings of these guys too they had like these old-timey wood drawings but again and other newspapers now are kind of starting to push back i think it was the herald who was like this isn't real, this isn't real. This is all made up. And other newspapers are still saying, we're going to present this article and we don't think it's real, but you guys want to read it, so here you go. And to be fair, the Sun was pretty much mum on it. They weren't like, no, this is absolutely real. They were just presenting the story. But the thing is, is how do you beat? You're on only on day four, and now you have man bats. And you have two more two more segments to go. How do you beat man bats? You don't, really. The next day was like, oh, we found this weird temple. And it was a huge temple that looked abandoned. And on the top of the temple was like a globe. And then there was like this gold, like a structure that looked like sculpture that looked like golden fire around the globe. And they're like, and and the article's like, does that tell the story of a tragedy that once struck the moon? Or does it tell a story of a tragedy that will strike Earth? Be back tomorrow for part six. And and people weren't disappointed. That was a, that it didn't add a new creature type, but it added it's basically the DLC. It didn't add a new creature type, but it added a new plot. It added a mystery. What is this structure? And they and then on day six, they're like, ah, oh, there's just some more there's just some more bad people. They totally gave up on day six. They basically, again, with the video game analogy, they just did some recoloring on the enemies they already have. They're like, ah, there's just some more bat people. And we noticed there were some bat people walking around the the creepy structure, and they were super beautiful. They were like as beautiful as an angel. They looked amazing. Like they, they were jaw-droppingly beautiful. So again, a very, very good telescope. 
Now, of course, eventually the story starts to get over to England, where Sir John Herschel is, and he hears about it, and first he thinks it's funny, but then everyone is asking, and no matter what he did, everyone's like, so what's going on with the creatures on the moon? And he started to get really irritated. He's like, there's no creatures on the moon, that story's made up, the story's made up. The, the lie began to fall apart, but this is the interesting thing. Nobody cared. Like, once it was discovered that it was a, a lie, a joke... Nobody cared. It, there wasn't this huge outrage. The sun didn't suffer any sort of financial or circulation drop. People just went on with their lives. People were like, that was, a, that was it. Thank you for making the past six days of my life really fun. And that was it. And everyone just went about their business. And it's notable because looking back, people didn't realize how powerful the media had become. That it could fool millions of people for a period of time. With completely made up stuff. And they didn't they didn't recognize how powerful the media had become because it was the very first mass media event. Nowadays we freak out over any any even suggestion of fake news. But back then it was just an entertaining tale that people liked to hear. It. And it was published as the truth in this newspaper that normally published just the news. So it's an interesting story. Oh, and Thomas Dick, of course, that's where he came in. He shows up and he's like, yes, of course there's people on the moon. I predicted there was 4 billion people on the moon. That's where he showed up. So when this came out as being a hoax, it tarnished his reputation a bit because he was trying to be on the science side. But for the general public, they just enjoyed a good story. But yeah, first mass media event slash a science fiction story slash a lesson in how to structure your reveals. Don't come out with man bats on day four. You gotta save it, because otherwise you really got nowhere to go from there. They could have said dragons. That probably would have been better. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next story here. Our next story is The Wreck of the Meduse. Now, it's in French. I'm not gonna speak in French, but I actually have an interesting story about that, but I'm running out of time, so. The story, the ship is French. It's it's, it's a French ship. So, whether or not I'm pronouncing Meduse right, I apologize once again. It means jellyfish in French. I know that. It's, it was this big boat. It was this big boat. Now, before we get started, like I said, this story is interactive. I want you to pick a number between 1 and 10. Go ahead and get that number in your head. And that number, if you pick the right one, you will survive this story. The Meduse was a boat, a big old boat. And we're back in the year 1816. We're headed to Seagal. Not Stephen but to the African country. France, the French were like, hey, we got to send this new governor down here. Let's get him on this boat. We'll send another couple boats with it. Be a short ride, no problem. Boats are chugging along. Now, the captain of the Meduse, it was controversial because he was promoted because of cronyism. He had no real experience being a captain of a boat. He just was popular with some people back home, and they said, ah, we'll give you this boat. So... He was very, very... He was an idiot, basically. This boat has 400 people on it. (sighs) Going through the ocean, right? And what happens is the captain's dicking around. The boat keeps veering off course. He goes, you know what? I think I know a shortcut. Just all sorts of bad stuff. And he ends up getting separated from the other ships that were in the little fleet that was going with him. And he's messing around, and he's like, you know what, I think we can cut some time off if we go closer to the coast. And more experienced sailors were like, okay, but this area might have some sandbars that... And he's like, ah, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. The only bar I care about is the one in Margaritaville. So the boat's coming down the coast of Africa. And he, like, literally, like, the way I'm reading this article, I'm picturing it as the captain and one of his buddies are, like, having a chat... As other people are running around the boat going, oh, dude, uh, what? Oh, my God, we're super close to the land. At one point, not the captain, another guy from his, in his own volition, grabs this, like, depth measuring tool and throws it overboard and finds out, like, they're super close to the land. And again, this isn't like a rowboat. It's a ship that can hold 400 people. And he's yelling to the captain, dude, dude, we are, this is super dangerous. This is super, super dangerous. At that point, the captain kind of like wises up, ends his conversation, and starts to try to control the ship, but it's too late. (laughs) Water. It hits a sandbar. It's 30 miles from where it needs to be. It's basically 30 miles from land. The other two ships are 
don't even know where the ship is. They don't have a radio, they don't have a phone, they don't have carrier pigeons, nothing like that. And so the captain's like, okay, this is bad. But we can stay here for a bit and figure stuff out. Storm starts rolling in. And they're like, okay, now this is really bad. The ship has a hole in it. It's stuck on the land. We don't have enough lifeboats to get everyone off. And they go, okay, well, let's do this. Let's take the boats we have, the the long boats, and we'll just take turns. We'll go to the land and we'll come back and we'll go to the land and come back. And then the storm, they're like, we don't have time to do that, Captain. So then they come up with another plan. They go, let's build... Because if they see this, one of those things that if they don't do anything, they're all dead. So they go, let's build a giant raft that can will put everyone... Everyone who can get into a longboat gets on a longboat, which means the important people, including the captain. And then everyone else gets on this giant homemade raft that we're going to make and we'll tow it with the longboat. So they begin assembling this raft before, you know, a, a, a big storm hits... I wonder how long it took them to create it, actually, now that I think about it. But anyways, they build this giant raft. They named it the Machine. Not a very good name, but they named it Machine. This raft, this raft is 66 feet long and 23 feet wide. And you're thinking, that's pretty big. But they put on it 147 people. So imagine 147 people being trapped in a place that's 66 feet long, 23 feet wide, and... And that place can sink at any given moment. Wasn't the best constructed raft. But anyways, they're like, it's going to have to do. So everyone jumps on the raft. A couple of people said, you know what? We're going to take our chances on. We're just going to stay on the boat. And you guys can send a rescue crew back for us. The boat's not going anywhere. If a storm hits, we'll go into the, we'll go underneath the boat. And hopefully we don't all get washed away. So everyone said their goodbyes. Well, not the people on the raft, but they said their goodbyes to the people on the boat. The raft gets tied to the long boats. Long boats start rowing towards the shore 30 miles. And they get, they don't get very far. And the people on the long boats start talking and they're just like, just going as hard as they can. They keep looking back at this raft of 147 people. Just like, it's not aerodynamic or not water dynamic, whatever it is. It's it's lagging them down. They're afraid a huge storm is going to come in and kill all of them. They turn to the captain and go, we, we got to cut it loose. There's no way we're going to make it to shore if with this raft on our tail. And now, can you imagine? Now, this is where your interactive part starts to come in. You're sitting on that raft. And they didn't. They threw a bunch of supplies on the raft, but they were boat supplies, not survival supplies. So they didn't have any sort of ability to steer the raft. They didn't have any ability. They didn't have any navigation tools for the raft. No compass. They, they didn't even bring water with them. They put all the ship's wine on the raft. Because, again, they're just trying to carry the stuff from the raft to the mainland. They didn't think it was going to be that hard. But you're about, let's say you're, let's say they maybe got you five miles. So you're 25 miles from land. And you're on this raft. And it's hot. And only the center of the raft is super stable. So everyone kind of tries to stay in the center. And so your legs are wet and you're sitting there. And you look and you see people in the longboats kind of talking to each other. Can't really hear what they're saying. And then... You see the captain nod, and people start cutting the ropes to your raft. Now, you know it's a death sentence. You absolutely know that if this raft just goes adrift 25 miles from land with no ability to steer it or or maneuver it in any way, you can't like, every, like hey, everyone on that side, paddle your hands like you're toast. The panic that must have been going through those people as those ropes were getting cut. But the ropes are cut. The longboats just leave the raft of 147 people. Well, what are you going to do? Well, fights immediately break out on the raft. Because again, they're basically like, this, it's us or them. You had people form up into groups. You had sailors group up. You had, there was a contingent of Marines. They grouped up. And then you had the passengers who were just going on this trip, this diplomatic mission, who didn't, weren't high enough to get into a boat. They're on this thing. The very first night, okay, so it's bad. People are arguing. One, You see one guy get stabbed, throw him overboard. And because the center of the raft was the only stable part of the boat, people kept jostling as they got into the middle of the raft. And then a fight would break out. A fight to the death. Because if you lost that fight, you were going either overboard or you were just going to be on the edge of the boat and go overboard anyways. The first night passes. You go to sleep. Sun comes up the next morning. There's 20 bodies. Out of the 146 people, 20 people died that first night. Some were suicides, which you got to be pretty determined to be able to commit suicide on a raft. 
in the middle of nowhere. What do you do? Just drink a bunch of salt water? Get splinters everywhere? I don't know how they kill themselves on a raft. Other people were murdered for a prime spot. That would be a horrible thing to wake up to. You wake up, 20 people are dead. You're like, oh no, that guy owed me money. He's like, ugh. Bunch of splinters all over his body. So now we're down to 126 people. So let's say if you pick the number five, you, you died that night. You're dead. If you pick the number five, you're dead. Boats going along. Like I said, they don't have any water, but they have a lot of wine, but that's not going to keep you hydrated. The machine, the rafts, going along. I, and I imagine at that point, it must be insanity because we had the first 20 die that night. And then even more, dozens of people died fighting over that middle spot or losing that spot and falling off the boat. Basically, imagine American gladiators, but it's just water everywhere and you die a horrible death. So they're fighting. Some people are sitting in the middle. Some people can't get to the middle and the boat tips too much. You just roll off and drown. So let's say if you pick the number seven, that is your fate. You're either beat to death by a French sailor or you say, I'd rather not get beat to death by a French sailor. I'll sit on the edge and then you just fall off and get eaten by a jellyfish, ironically. A human-sized jellyfish eats you. We're on day four. Only 67 people left out of 146. So we've lost a good amount of people. That's about half. So I'm going to get rid of two numbers now. These people were eaten. Now, not all, not all of them, but at this point, day, and it's only day four, they're like, we got to start eating people. We got to start eating people because there's no, we have no food. That's the only way to do it. So the, they, people got either killed for food or there was still like some body, some guy who committed suicide. They, they're like, I'll just leave him there. I'm too tired to move him. They eat him. So, but in that time period of, let's say if you pick the numbers 10, you get eaten. You get eaten on this boat. <laughs> Day eight. It's day eight now. Boats. It's in the middle of nowhere. I mean, they can't even see land at this point. There's not a lot of people left on the boat. You are, though. Let's see if you picked the lucky number. If you picked any number other than the number I'm about to reveal, you just died of an embarrassing death. You had, if you picked one and two, let's say you had explosive diarrhea and just it blew up, showered everyone with it. But anyway, so now there's a couple people left and the strong on the boat. The ones who have maintained their strength this whole time, both mentally and physically, make a decision to save what very little supplies we have left. We have a bunch of beef jerry, and we have some soup of Sally. There was one woman on the boat, and they don't say when she died, but apparently she did. We have some soup of Sally over there, and we have this Tom ramen. We don't have a lot of cannibalized food left, so we're going to have to throw all the weak overboard. We're just going to murder them, so we know that we'll live a little bit longer. So the strong people, the mongos of the vessel, pick up the weak and just toss them overboard. Or possibly kill them and ate them. That's possible too. But they definitely didn't make it. So if you picked, you got turned into a tasty delicacy. If you picked six, you got um, an STD from a starfish that got you in the middle of the night. And if you picked, what other ones haven't I done? Eight or nine, you you fell into the water, but your wrist got wrapped around a rope at the bottom of the machine. And so every time it came up a little bit from the wave, you would be able to get one breath of air, but then it would go back down and hold you underwater for 30 seconds. And then it would lift you up and you'd get one breath of air and it'd hold you down for 30 seconds. And that just goes on and on for about two days <laughs> until you suffocate. So... Horrible death, guys. You won. Actually, if you pick number three, you were one of the 15, which actually, you out of 100, close to 150 people, 15 people lived. So if you pick number three, you have survived the wreck of the Medusa. You had a 10% chance of making it. Some people had sexual relations with the starfish. Some people explosive diarrhea. Some people died in ways they actually died in on the Medusa. This all came out. Eventually, of course, the 15 guys did get rescued. And the captain was held liable for it, but not for, like, murder or anything, like, that he really should have been held liable for. He got held liable for basically abandoning his ship, and he served three years in jail. And that was it. And now the French have a law saying if you want to be promoted in the military, it has to be based on merit, not on who you know. So it did... This incident was did cause a lot of outrage in France... And it did become part of the law. And there's actually this famous picture called the Wreck of the Medusa or the Raft of the Medusa or something like that. It's this great Renaissance, not Renaissance, that was earlier, but it's this great painting 
But people have also said that painting, it, it's kind of a symbol of hope because everyone's like, yay, look at the rescue boat. It's that moment rather than that first night where people are like cutting their throats with, you know, boat rope. They're tying nautical knots around their neck. Like it's this moment of hope, not this like horrible other eight days of what actually went on. So people, some people consider that painting to be a whitewash. But I hope you lived. I hope you did not die during that little segment, especially not in some of the ways I made up. But I hope you guys had fun either way. I had fun. I think that's an interesting story. Like I said, I like stories about, I think being lost at sea is very terrifying. I'm sure it happens all the time and we never hear about it because no one gets rescued. It's just a boat disappearing. Dead Rabbit Radio at Gmail. And I don't, I don't, my, I don't do boats. My dad's a big boat guy. I'm, nah, I'm good. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one.